Now, when John Courtney won Britain's Got Talent last year, it should have been one of the happiest moments of his life. But behind the scenes, he was secretly battling skin cancer after being diagnosed just weeks before the live final. Well, thankfully, following a successful operation, he's now been given the all-clear, and today he's joining us alongside Dr Chris to raise awareness of the signs you should be looking out for. And good morning to both of you, and thank you. I mean, John, I was, you know, right. really sad to hear this, what you were going through at a time that should have been one of the happiest moments of your life. Um, but for you, you know, you knew the signs, you knew the things to look out for because you'd had a family bereavement from skin cancer previously. So just take us back to February when you noticed a change in your mole. Yeah, I mean, I had no, no excuses for delaying it, really. Um, I, I made all the excuses. Obviously, COVID came along and I was, I was still working up until March. I noticed it in probably the end of January um, and I had a couple of moles removed from my stomach before. Um, that were slightly discoloured. So they, they said that was a couple of years ago. They said they want to get rid of those. So I, I didn't know what to look out for. And this one just suddenly appeared. Um, and it had all the things wrong with it. It suddenly appeared. It was discoloured. Um, it was a weird shape. And I just put it off um, stupidly. Uh, yeah, it looks like nothing there, doesn't it? Um, it, it? It's the one, the second one, yeah. So, um, yeah, I just put it off. And it wasn't until sort of July time that I went to my GP and said, you should maybe have a look at this. And he was, he said immediately, he said, that needs to go. Um, so I thought, oh, I should have probably come in sooner than this. Um, I was very lucky. Uh, but, yeah. But it was your <laughs> father-in-law that sadly uh, lost his life to skin cancer. So, as Holly said there, you know, this, this, this is something that, the, the alarm bells were all, they were you know, sort of hanging on the wall, ready to ring. Yeah, I, I never got to meet my father-in-law. He died the year before I met my, my wife. Um, but he had an undiagnosed melanoma just on his finger, and it spread very quickly. Um, so affected my wife badly, um, and all her family, obviously. So, yeah, it was, it was at the forefront of my... Like I say, I've got no excuse for, for, for delaying it and, and, and putting it off. Um, which is really why, why I'm doing this, to, to tell people, that even during COVID, you know, GPs will still prioritise suspected lumps and moles and that sort of stuff, so phone them and, and do it, because speed can be of the essence, you know. Well, you, had, um, you went to see a specialist in August, and then you had the mole removed, and this was just sort of days before the Britain's Got Talent semi-finals. You decided not to tell anyone on the production, just to keep this very much to yourself. Why was that? Well... I know BGT are making a TV show and it's almost a cliche now that people have these sob stories when they, when they come on the show. Um, and I didn't want to be that. I, I didn't want it to be about my head. I wanted it to be about the fact that I was trying to have this break in my career for, after sort of 30 years. Um, and it was really important. I, I didn't want the, the press to suddenly be, you know, BGT semi-finalist or whatever, battling skin. It, it, it would have taken, it would have detracted from what I was trying to do. Um, and also, I didn't want to make it public to all my family and friends. There was a phone call, you know, I, I couldn't have done it in the newspaper and on TV. It would have meant a lot of phone calls and a lot of explanations. And I just didn't know how it was going to turn out, you know. So, um, yeah, sort of kept it between myself and a couple of very close friends and, and my wife. Well, you, you, nearly, you nearly didn't tell Emma, your wife. Yeah, uh, well, because of what she went through with her dad, um, when I was at the hospital and they told me they give you a cup of tea afterwards and they sort of sit you down and, are you OK? And I thought I was OK when I was at the hospital. I thought this, this you know, everything in my... I've never faced anything this sort of health-wise bad before. Um, but anything in my life that sort of knocked me back, I sort of, I'm, I'm very much a pick myself up person. I'm optimistic. I you know, give myself a little talking to and just get on with it. So I figured that would be the case. And I, I was driving home and I thought maybe I won't, I won't tell her. You know, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll be brave enough that I can do this on my own. And I totally wasn't. I got home and her, obviously she knew I'd gone to the hospital. And I, I walked in and as soon as I saw her face, I, I just told her and had a little cry. Um, and it all sort of hit me. At the, at the, at the, this, this is weird. It's actually the first time I've sort of spoken about it to anybody other than my wife, apart from one person of the press. So it's, it's, it's a bit strange. Um, yeah, so um, I, I told her, and I'm so glad I did. I mean, she's been amazing. And also, the other reason for tr doing this little campaign, really, is um, in conjunction with Macmillan, um, I wish I'd known that I could have phoned them. I was always of the opinion that they were for people that were worse than me, people like end of life or people that were, were going through chemo, anything worse than what I was going through. Um, but that's not the case. They are very much there. And it, it's sort of great to have that contact of somebody who's not too emotionally involved. Because um, obviously, you know, my wife and my, and my best friend and stuff, it, it was tough. But I wish I'd picked up the phone to, to somebody like Macmillan. They could have, I mean, I had all kinds of issues in my head. They were talking about it going to my lymph nodes. So immediately my brain went to lymphatic cancer. And that's not the case. Secondary cancer in your lymph nodes is not, is not the same as lymphatic cancer. And that was keeping me awake for nights and nights and nights, going to some really dark places. 
Um, and I, I could have helped that just with a phone call to, to somebody like Macmillan, you know. Well, you didn't, uh, even yeah. for, the, for the Christmas show, the BGT Christmas show, um, you'd, hold, you'd had the operation by that stage and uh, you just said that you got a head wound, you still didn't tell them what it was, so they just put, they put a Santa hat on you. Yeah, thank goodness it was Christmas. They, they made me this gorgeous hat, because I, I, I bought a couple of hats, you know, the usual sort of Santa hats, and they just weren't big enough, because the, the, the dressing, I mean, it was bigger than this, I had a big blue sponge that was stapled to my head because um, it's really important. But the, the, I had sort of quite an experimental uh, artificial skin graft, which nobody had had before at, at Christie's Hospital. And they have to staple a big sponge to your head to stop it moving. So it looked like a proper Frankenstein thing stuck on. So no hats fit me. So as soon as I got to the, the costume the department of BGT, which was the day after the operation, um, and I was a bit groggy still, I'm in a bit of pain, but they said, I said, look, I've had this operation, and they immediately made me this gorgeous, lush Christmas hat with a big fur trim and bling, which thankfully I got to wear for all the sort of corporate shows I was doing here in my studio after, after the BGT show. If it wasn't Christmas, I don't know what, what I would have I worn. Know. Well, it's um, incredible. I mean, yeah. talk about the show must go on. I mean, you really epitomise that, don't you? And the, thankfully, it hadn't spread to your lymph nodes. They had got it all there and, and you were doing really well, which is brilliant. Um, Dr Chris, I wanted to bring you into the conversation now um, because th what are the things that people should be, be looking for? Well, um, I mean, John's had a, a melanoma, and most melanomas uh, arise from moles. Some don't, but most of them do. So you have to be on mole watch, checking your moles. And the changes that occur in a mole where melanoma is developing are, are varied. And I want to show the viewers three photographs of melanomas to show you the difference between a mole and a melanoma. So if we could bring one of those up now, I can describe what's going on there. Now, now here's a mole. It's not like a normal mole, which is oval or circular. This has got a very irregular edge. Uh, you've got different colors w within the mole, deep brown, almost black, red, due to inflammation. That is you know, typical uh, melanoma. And moving on to the next one, there'll be similar changes. Now, you see this one has got a large black area and a very irregular edge. With the moles, look at the edges. Edges of a normal mole should be smooth. These are irregular. And the surface of melanomas are often bumpy. And then the third example to show you, uh, look at this one. I mean, you know, very abnormal shape. Black throughout nearly, but the lighter brown around the edges. And again, look at the edging. It's very, very irregular. These are obviously not normal moles. Now, also, melanomas can itch, uh, they can bleed, uh, and they can ooze fluid. So, you know, keep an eye on your moles. If you've got more than 10 moles on your upper arm, that means you've probably got about 100 on your body. And the more moles you've got, then that increases your risk of melanoma. Not saying it will, but it increases your risk. So have someone check the moles on your back. You can't see them. And any change, go to the GP. And, John, I must congratulate you on winning British God's Talent and also winning your battle with melanoma. And you know what's interesting, John, about you? I, I saw the photograph of your mole and I enlarged it on my mobile phone. And sure enough, you are right, it's irregular, uh, it, it different colours. But also notice where it occurs. You shave your head because you're shaving your head, there's no hair protecting your scalp against the sun's rays. And it's interesting with yeah. cancers yeah. of, the, uh, of the, 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 the face and the head, they tend to occur above the line drawn from the corner of your mouth to your earlobe. Above that line is the sort of danger area for skin cancers. I know, I've had two. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Dr Chris, thank you. Um, uh, thank you so much for talking to us, John. It's, uh, yeah, it's, well done, you. Uh, amazing for th that, you're, that you're speaking out about this, that you are talking about it, and the work that you're doing for Macmillan as well, who are amazing people. I wrote, I, wrote, I, I wrote a song about it, Phil, obviously. That's online as well, the Mole Song, because, you know, that's what I do. So check out the Mole Song. It's on my socials. Absolutely. <laughs> you stay well. Take thank care. Thank you very much indeed. Thank bye you. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Bye.